All right, guys, today we're going to be talking about helmet selection and setup for use with night vision. I change my helmets like some people change their socks, so I've gone through a whole bunch of different helmet setups in a fairly short period of time. Today we're going to be doing sort of a surface level overview of all the different aspects of helmet selection and setup, and some of the uh, finer points we're going to have to go into more detail at a later date. You know, I don't normally like doing intros because I think they're kind of a waste of time, but I'm going to engage in just a little bit of shameless self-promotion right off the bat here. If you like this channel, make sure you subscribe, and if you'd like to support me directly, you can do so via Subscribestar. There's a link in the video description, and let's go for it. Probably the first thing that you're going to have to decide when you're buying a helmet is if you're going to go for a bump or a ballistic helmet. I cannot exactly tell you which is right for you. I can just sort of give you an idea of the pros and cons. The two big ones that everybody knows about already are basically just weight and cost. A decent entry-level bump helmet setup is going to cost you way less than even probably a lower-end ballistic helmet. Obviously, we're talking about ballistic helmets, we're just assuming that you're only going to buy something that's legitimately NIJ certified and uh, not some weird fly-by-night Chinese garbage. So if that's the case, then yeah, ballistic helmets are way more expensive than bump helmets. And they also weigh a lot more, which is definitely going to become a factor as you start to attach counterweights, accessories, mounts, night vision, lights, all that stuff to the helmet itself. No, I know some guys will say, hey, I'd rather just wear a ballistic helmet with no counterweight because that's going to weigh the same as a bump helmet with a counterweight. Uh, and that's sort of true. I think there's a bit of a rounding error involved there. Um, first of all, when it comes to weight, every little bit on a helmet counts because this thing is on the top of your head and it's going to put a lot of strain on your neck and your spinal column. So you don't want to just indulge in frivolous weight. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that balance is a huge thing with helmets. If someone says that they don't need to run a counterweight with a ballistic helmet, uh, I question how long they've actually worn that helmet or if maybe they're just sort of a masochist. So if you take two helmets, a bump helmet and a ballistic helmet, and they're both of equivalent weights, that bump helmet is going to be all day comfortable. You're going to be able to wear that, wear that forever because it's going to have a nice probably counterweight setup. And it's also probably going to have uh, some useful accessories attached to it, whereas that ballistic helmet is going to destroy your neck in short order and probably won't have the same level of capability. Another overlooked property of bump helmets is ventilation. Since they can have holes in the top of them, they can breathe a lot better, which is going to be a big benefit if you are in a hot environment or you plan to like go hiking or doing a lot of strenuous activity in your helmet. But obviously, if you need ballistic protection, then the choice has already been made for you and you need to get a ballistic helmet, not a bump helmet. That is your call, not mine. Obviously, if you're going to set up a helmet for use with night vision, you're going to need some kind of mount on it. There are a ton of these out there and they tend to be very polarizing, so that's probably going to have to be a video all on its own. Suffice to say that there are a bunch of different types of mounts that attach to different types of shrouds, but there's almost always going to be something out there that'll fit your head, your helmet, your nod, and uh, probably even your, your price bracket, although you might have to be prepared to spend a little bit more if you want something lightweight and with a little more capability. First thing we're going to be talking about is attaching ear protection to your helmet. It is technically possible to wear hearing protection standalone underneath your helmet, either the rigid headband style or the soft headband with the rigid neckband style. How possible and comfortable that is kind of depends on the helmet. If the helmet has a suspension that's just a bunch of pads and a chin strap, then you can remove pads to make room for a headband. Uh, if, however, your helmet has a sort of a ratcheting uh, plastic headband strap or suspension strap on the inside, then you're probably not going to be able to get away with wearing the uh, headband style ear protection. You might still be able to use the neckband style that has just like the soft uh, like Velcro or, you know, fabric loop over the top. Uh, that'll probably depend on what helmet you're wearing, the shape of your head, the position of your ears on your head. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is different cuts of helmets. This is a super high cut helmet. I found after a lot of experimentation that I really could only use super high cut helmets. High cut helmets are a little bit lower around the ears and just due to the shape of my head and the position of my ears on my head, high cut helmets push my hearing protection off. The advantage to running your hearing protection separate from the helmet is that you can take the helmet off and still have hearing protection and potentially integrated communications. However, one of the big downsides that I think a lot of people don't realize is that the hearing protection is actually a significant driver of stability. If you have 
hearing protection mounted to you know the rails of your helmet i've often found that i don't have to run the suspension as tight or the straps as tight uh, i don't have to maybe put as much counterweight in there because you have additional stability on the sides of your head also hearing protection is very comfortable compared to uh, the straps and pads and weights on a helmet particularly if you have like something with uh you know gel cups because it's a lot of surface area and it's a very soft very wide uh, sort of contact patch on the head. So as far as what headset to mount to a helmet, I would not recommend MSA Sordens at all. Uh, they are extremely clumsy to try to mount to a helmet. Very frustrating. There are aftermarket uh, solutions that, that try to make it work, but they really are a total hack and I, I don't recommend them at all. There are a bunch of different options for helmet mounted hearing protection. There are Peltor Comtacs, there are the Opscore Amps, there is the Auto Noise Barrier Tack, and there are the newer Safariland Liberator 4s. All of those can be had with helmet mounts for different helmet styles and different accessory rails. For example, this is similar to an Opscore R rail. There's also proprietary rails from Team Wendy and the uh, M-Lock inspired ones from M-Tech and Hardhead Veterans if you're going that route. I can't totally say for sure, but it's been my experience that the side-mounted Ear Pro seems to add more stability to a helmet than the rear-mounted Ear Pro. Opscore amps have a uh, rear-mounted swing arm that allows them to swing out that way as opposed to these which sort of rotate back and forth and pop in and out against your head. The advantage to the rear mounted ones is that it leaves the top rail open for other accessories but that stability factor of the side mounted ones definitely seems nice. Also these are typically a little more affordable. When it comes to accessories there's a ton of different stuff you can attach to your helmet some of it very useful some of it probably not so much but that really depends on uh, your specific needs and what you're trying to get out of the helmet probably the main thing that everybody wants to put on there right away is an ir flasher because they look really cool you play that uh, call of duty modern warfare mission um, and you see the ir strobes and you're like damn that's hot and it absolutely is IR strobes can also be useful even if you don't have close air support just in a uh, range context. For example, if you have to go down range to reset a target or check on something, you can, you know, call ceasefire, turn your flasher on. That way when your buddies look down range, they see the flash and they know not to shoot you. Another thing the IR flasher can be used for is signaling on a lot of newer stripped down lightweight night vision housings. The IR flash feature is uh, eliminated because it typically doesn't serve all that much of a purpose, but it can be useful for signaling. If you don't have one of those, you can say, hey, I'm, uh, you know, I'm on the ridge opposite you. Look for my flash and you can turn your flasher on and then someone will say, hey, I see your flash, turn their flasher on. You're like, cool, we see each other. Awesome. Good work. And we didn't need to uh, pulse our nods, do the little nipple twist thing on the back of the PVS-14. This video is really going badly. Anyway. The slot's just really small and narrow and there's like no real channel to guide it in. I guess that's what she said, but you know, whatever. Insert rod A into slot B. Penis. Yep, that was what that means. Um, the other thing you might want to consider is a light, either a task light or an actual supplemental illumination. There are a bunch of different purpose-built task lights that usually have extremely low output and often are able to cycle between colors like red, blue, white, IR, um, and some of them will have flexible little heads so you can, you know, point a very dim red light down at whatever you're doing as a task light, map reading light, what have you, without necessarily pumping out a whole ton of illumination. Um, the other thing you might want is the possibility to have supplemental illumination, you know, uh, either white light just for general range tasks or IR if you want to provide supplemental illumination. For example, if you're in a very dark indoor environment, you might want to be able to provide IR umbrella illumination. That's where something like a helmet mounted, uh, like a high output light comes into play. This is a Surefire Vampire. Um, there are a couple of different uh, IR and white combination lights that you can use for that purpose. Moving on to counterweights. This is an extremely important part of helmet setup. I don't know why I waited this long uh, to talk about it, but that's what it says on my sticky note. So we're doing it right now. You really need to be able to balance out the weight of the night vision device hanging out over the front of your face. Uh, because the night vision device sticks out really far in front of your face, it's gonna drag the helmet down. And uh, if you don't have a good counterweight, then there are really only a couple ways you can compensate for the helmet dragging down. One is to tighten the suspension a lot more and uh, the straps as well. Um, and the other is to just crane your neck muscles until you get a fucking migraine. So I would recommend that you try to add some counterweight to your helmet, even if you're using a ballistic. 
uh, counterweight pouches. There's a ton of different ones available. There are ones that Velcro onto a helmet. There are ones that bolt onto the rails. Um, and then there are also a lot of helmet covers that have integrated counterweight pouches. Basically what you do is you stick some weights in there and that balances out your nod. But counterweight pouches uh, can also just be used to hold extra stuff like batteries. They can also be used for routing wires. So some kind of a pouch arrangement um, and, and especially like shot cord and bungees and stuff are quite useful on a helmet. You can, if you're using a lighter weight night vision device, like if you have a PVS-14, you don't need to go crazy on the counterweights, but you've got these extra slots in the counterweight pouch. You can just cram some batteries in there for your weapon light, for your night vision device, whatever. So very useful to have. Again, this is one of those topics where there are so many different brands of counterweights, so many different styles and so many different ways to set them up that it would probably have to be a video all on its own. I'm sure somebody has already made one, maybe Sam from Silent Solutions before he uh, committed seppuku on youtube for some reason uh r.i.p sam anyway maybe we'll talk about that some more some other time another thing you might want to put on your helmet is a helmet cover for a whole bunch of different reasons one is just because they look cool and you can add camouflage to a helmet that might otherwise be a solid color or if it's a bump helmet it might be relatively shiny plastic you can also use these helmet covers for routing cables like i have my uh my headset cable goes underneath the helmet cover here um, helmet covers also can have attachment points, additional Velcro for attaching uh, patches or IR glints to make you look extra cool. Um, a lot of them will have bungee on them for routing cables or for, you know, tucking different strobes on there. Uh, so a cover could be pretty useful. If you've got a bump helmet, I'd recommend you get a ventilated cover so that you don't lose out on the ventilation of the bump helmet. Um, if you get a ballistic helmet, you probably don't want it to be super ventilated because part of the uh, benefit of having a helmet cover is that it protects the body of the helmet, which is a very expensive thing, from you know abrasion and damage. Just the helmet cover itself can add a little bit of camouflage to your helmet, but you can also go a little farther with it, like with camouflage netting or scrim to really break up the outline or silhouette of your helmet. Because if you just look at this thing, you notice there's a lot of shapes on here that can only be interpreted as a dude in tactical gear. There are no Surefire M300 vampires in nature, as far as I know. All right, let's talk about some helmets that I would or would not recommend. If you're going for an entry-level bump helmet, you've got options like the Opscore Fast Bump Helmet or the Team Windy Exfil LTP. Both of those are good options. Generally speaking, the Opscore is going to be a little bit better in the accessories department because they use the Opscore Arc Rails, which I think are, are just a much better option, just more flexible down the line. However, the Team Windy helmets have a better suspension and pad arrangement out of the box, so you don't really have to upgrade that. Uh, Team Windy LTP helmets also have a replaceable shroud with a metal insert, whereas the Opscore bump is just uh, integral plastic, so a little probably uh, less long-lived than a helmet with either a replaceable shroud or at least a metal insert to uh, kind of stiffen it up a little bit. If you're only interested in a bump helmet for the lightweight and ventilation, but you're willing to spend a whole lot of money, you can go with the Opscore Carbon. That one is a super high cut bump helmet. It's the only one that I know of on the market, um, which would be a boon to me because that's what I need to use in order to uh, clear my ear pro. The Carbon is a way better helmet than the uh, fast bump. It has a more proper, you know, replaceable shroud. It also has a way better suspension and liner system, but it's basically a ballistic helmet in terms of price without ballistic protection. For ballistic helmets, again, you've got Opscore and Team Wendy. They're similar in price and features. Opscore has a bunch of different types of helmet with kind of confusing names, and they seem to reintroduce new ones and discontinue them all the time. Um, just sort of a, a buyer's tip. If you are trying to buy an Opscore ballistic helmet, just make sure you're not buying a super old, super heavy version, thinking you're getting a good deal. They might just be clearing out inventory. So if you see a really surprisingly affordable ballistic helmet, you should be suspicious because um, either it's fake or it's not NIJ certified or it's like an outdated Opscore that weighs six pounds. So just keep that in mind when you're shopping around. There are other brands of helmets like the M-Tech. They make a ballistic and a bump helmet, but not a huge fan of their accessory rails because they use M-Lock and uh, just kind of a weird ecosystem that I would recommend that you avoid entirely. There are also some really oddball options on the market like this. This is an Avon Ceridine N49 ULW. This is a super high cut uh, modern ballistic helmet. These are a bit more affordable than an equivalent Opscore or Team Wendy, but still overall a pretty damn good helmet. If you really need ballistic protection, but you're on a super tight budget, you could always pick up a military surplus ACH helmet. Some of those have uh, holes drilled in the front for mounting a night vision shroud, and some of them do not. If it doesn't have the shroud holes pre-drilled, then you might have to get a ratchet 
ratcheting strap style night vision mount. A little bit hokey, but you probably could make it work. Um, also, difficult to mount accessories to an ACH helmet, but you can just rearrange the pads on the inside and then wear your hearing protection underneath it if you want. It's not going to be the most comfortable, the most lightweight, high speed, low drag type of thing, but you can definitely make it work and it's probably ballistic rated, although, you know, surplus helmets that you buy on the gray market uh, are not the most dependable source of body armor. And the last helmet that's kind of interesting and worth mentioning is the CVC Soha. That is a combat vehicle crewman special operations headset adaptable helmet. It's basically a vehicle crew helmet that has had the Bose like intercom headset system ripped out and replaced with a normal set of pads and suspension. You can also find a lot of those that have been converted for night vision use or tactical use, if you want to call it that, with you know night vision shrouds, accessory rails, stuff like that. Uh, some of those are of kind of questionable provenance. Most of those started life as you know, real military surplus helmets. The conversion work may have been done by some random dude on the street. So you kind of never know exactly what you're getting. Those do have some interesting advantages. One, they're cheap. Two, they are complete with you know all the accessories that you're going to find on a modern expensive ballistic helmet. They're, they might be ballistic rated. They were at some point in their history. Um, and three, they have extremely high uh, ear cut cups. So I had a Soha for a while. I actually quite liked it. Um, probably should have just kept it. Uh, this is obviously a much better helmet than that, but man, it was cool. And it certainly did everything I needed it to. And finally, I'm going to tell you about the setup of this helmet. This is the Avon N49 Ceridine ULW, whatever you want to call it. It is a relatively lightweight ballistic helmet. This one is super high cut. That is a feature that I really need because of my weird ear problem. I have uh, mounted to this thing just uh, Peltor Contact 3 single comms on the regular Peltor mounts. Um, I like the Peltor mounts because they are easy to find and fairly affordable. Uh, they also have the feature where they click in. That can be good or bad. There are other uh, EarPro mounts. Um, for example, I think Unity makes one called the Mark, the Modular Attached Rail Kit, something like that. Uh, the Unities just create constant pressure and push down, which can be a good thing because if you bump your EarPro, it'll just push itself back in. But on the other, on the other uh, flip side of that, um, these, when they pop out, you can still hear what's going on through your headset, but you get a little bit of ventilation, which is pretty nice. Uh, also, I just find these to be a little easier to set up and a little bit more comfortable than the uh, the Mark style Ear Pro. I'm also not really a big fan of converting contacts to mount to the rear with the OpsCore style arms, like with the uh, axle rack link system. Um, it's just, just kind of hokey, man. I don't know. And they, they squish the, uh, the microphone foam and... They got Tagris on them, so they look like shit. I'm just not really a fan. It's definitely something you could do. Um, I would consider it because there's not a whole lot of rail accessory space on this helmet, so mounting stuff up here becomes pretty difficult when you're using the uh, the uh, Comtex and the Peltor, you know, factory Peltor mounts. However, there's still workarounds. Uh, this is a Unity Remora mount for a Surefire Light. The Unity Remora integrates with the Peltor mount. Um, and it basically just gives you this ratcheting flashlight mount. So I have a Surefire M300 Vampire on here. Uh, this is a white end IR light, so you can use the IR for you know signaling or for uh, supplemental illumination. If you're just on the range and you need additional white light for task light purposes, you've got white light as well. This does uh, stick out quite a lot, and it weighs a lot compared to those tiny little task lights with the flexible arms, but this does a lot more stuff so I prefer having this versus just one of those tiny little task lights. The mount that I'm using on this is a Nerodos Losto Dovetail. I previously had a Rhino with a uh, Mod Armory PYRM Dovetail conversion. Uh, I switched to this one because when I started using the uh, Eternus you know, 3D printed Sentinel style night vision, it doesn't articulate. So when I fold my night vision up, uh, if it was on a Rhino, it'd be sitting way too high. So this allows it to sit more forward of the helmet, which doesn't balance as well, but it does keep the profile of the helmet a lot lower for walking through doorways or under branches or getting into vehicles. The helmet cover is by Agilite. This is the only helmet cover that I know of that's actually purpose built for the super high cut ULW helmet. Um, I've heard that you can get, you know, certain types of ops core ballistic helmet covers. You know, you gotta size them up or down or you gotta trim them or you just gotta kind of like tuck fabric in here or there. Uh, 
you know, maybe I'll give that a try sometime, but this helmet cover is fine for now. The Agilite cover has a built-in counterweight pouch, so I didn't have to buy a separate standalone counterweight pouch for this. Um, the helmet cover routes cables underneath it. Counterweight pouch holds uh, batteries and some weights, as well as serves as a place to uh, tuck cables. Cable management, um, kind of uh, frustrating on helmets. You know, you just take your, your common down lead and stick it up in the, uh, the bungees. Also, uh, it really helps if you have contacts and you're trying to sort of manage the little tiny cables that stick every which way off of the contacts. These are um, dynamic fuzz covers. Basically, it's an adhesive uh, Velcro that attaches to the ear pro. And then there is a camouflage like patch that you can stick over the top of it. So the uh, wire for the Peltors is actually running underneath this patch. So not only does it add some camouflage, but it actually just gives you a nice way to route cables um, so that they don't stick out as much and they're not as prone to getting snagged. Uh, these also, these contacts also have dynamic fuzz baffles in them, which are just a way to add a little bit of extra noise reduction to old headsets that don't have a very good NRR rating. These also do have the gel cup upgrade. So between that, even though these are an old set of contacts with the upgrades, they still work reasonably well. And it's got one single NATO TP120 down lead for integration with push attacks. The IR flasher is a Spark IR. These things have integral batteries. You can't replace them, so once they die, you just throw them away, but they're very cheap. Uh, that, you know, is fine for me because I don't use these very often. Like, uh, if you're ever walking around in the woods with your buddies and someone's got their flasher on, it's really annoying. Every time you look over at them, you get blinded. Also, you know, it could give away your position. So it's not something that you just turn on as soon as it gets dark and leave on all the time. You use it very sparingly. However, uh, because the battery life is short and not replaceable, you know, just periodically check if you're bringing this thing out of storage or, you know, stick it in a box, just check to see if it turned itself on because you don't want it to just die in the box and you're out, you know, 15 bucks and you didn't even get to have any fun. Um, patches, got uh, IR glints on the side, make you a little bit more visible if somebody shoots some IR your direction. That's just sort of like a, I know, a team ID thing. Um, I also have my name on the helmet so nobody tries to steal my helmet because they know it belongs to me. Uh, and also have a uh, possum patch from Possums of Hazard because that guy's cool and possums are fun. So there you go. That is my helmet and that is everything that I currently know about helmet selection and setup. Uh, some of these topics I'm going to have to go into more detail later. There's just no way to talk about every single task light and uh, helmet mounted light, every single night vision mount, all the different counterweight options. We cannot cover that all in this video. They will have to be broken out into their own videos. So if you're interested in that sort of stuff, let me know. Uh, stay tuned. Subscribe. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Um, buy my merch. I don't have any merch, but if I had some, would you buy it? No, you wouldn't. Shut the fuck up.